Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Cimolino. I'm the Artistic Director of the Stratford Festival. And today we are going to be meeting an extraordinary man of the theatre, the director of our 2018 production of Coriolanus, a person who is a playwright, a person who's an actor, whose work has been performed all over the world. You'll know him. Maybe you haven't had a chance to hear him speak, and that'll be a treat today. We have with us Robert Lepage. Hi, Robert. Hi, how are you doing, Anthony? I am okay. It, they're strange times. And I was uh, just uh, saying to Robert a moment ago that we have both of us built theaters along with our companies recently. And now, of course, we are faced with a time of pandemic. So how are things in Quebec City for you and Ex Machina? Well, it's very quiet, actually. Uh, Quebec City is already a very quiet uh, city in the winter. So this is even quieter. Uh, it's kind of strange because, you know, it's our, it's our first year at, at the Diamond. The Diamond is, of course, the name of this uh, new venue that we've built and uh, everything was going so well and we're so happy and all that. Now we have to start all over again. Uh, to, yeah. We don't have the same kind of reputation or tradition as Stratford or other theatres have, so uh, we have to uh, start all over. Well, strength to you in the, in the months ahead. Yeah. Uh, Robert, uh, let's go back in time to uh -huh. times when people could congregate in a theater. And I'm thinking now mm -hmm. of your beautiful production of 887 that you acted in as well, as well as writing. And you were performing it at the Edinburgh Festival in August of 2015. Mm -hmm. And you and I had dinner and uh, we were trying to find a project that would uh, attract you to come and do at Stratford. And we began to talk about Coriolanus. Mm -hmm. And you talked about something that completely uh, uh, drew me in, and that was the role of the voices in this play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, sorry, I should have introduced the play a little bit. Coriolanus is a play about a, a leader um, uh, who is a military man. He's very proud, he's very accomplished, but he's not empathetic. He doesn't even like leadership. Probably his best quality is he's in, unable to lie. And, um, and therefore he suffers the price of not getting the support of the people. And the people are very important. Their voices are very important in this play. And normally it's staged with big crowds. And then Robert, you told me about your vision of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, of course, because uh, the thing that's quite interesting in the play is, is uh, uh, that the, actually the real rivals are not, are not of Ophidius and Coriolanus, it's, it's the, the voice of the people against the old established power. And uh, that for me resounded a lot uh, in our uh, actual predicament, but uh, also uh, because we're very obsessed by social media, by uh, how the press has changed its role with, with time and uh, uh, how newspapers don't have the same impact as uh, uh, media, uh, technological media and all that. So I was very intrigued. And, and you could find uh, the, um, uh, the sources uh, of how that works, how the, the internet works and how social media came about in uh, Roman history. Because, you know, I was very, very uh, surprised to discover, for example, the thumbs up and thumbs down thing that Nero or Caesar does at the, at the circus is actually the same thumb up and thumb down that we have on Facebook when somebody likes something or doesn't like something. And then it goes further, the whole expression of the wall, for example, you know, the, the Romans had this thing called the wall where you would go and you would write, okay, I'm looking for somebody to build this for me. Is there anybody here who knows about this or that? And somebody would write on the other side of the wall the answer. So uh, the internet started to work pretty much with the same kind of uh, vocabulary as the Romans did. And, and they even had this thing, this kind of wax tablet that had the exact same dimensions and rounded corners as the iPad. And okay. people would, would write with sticks and wax like that. So uh, that, uh, that thing intrigued me. And, and I could actually understand that at that time when, when Rome is trying to um, establish the basis of its republic and democracy and all that, that the public opinion is important and they would, they would start to create these devices to have people uh, say, 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 give their opinion, but also elect people, elect uh, tribunes to, to actually speak for them. So um, the dissemination of information, mm -hmm. uh, the way that it was made bite size was like the precursor to what we do today. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Robert, uh, let's talk about the people then. Um, you know, by the time you directed this, and you did two workshops, right, in Quebec City, uh, 
I think around 2017, 2016, 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and then you directed it in the spring of 18 for the final production. Um, there was a real rise in populism during that course of time. Yeah. And yeah. is that what you're referring to in terms of the power establishment versus the people? Well, yeah, yeah, in a certain way, but we were also come, at that time we were coming out of the whole one uh, percent riots in the U.S. and and uh, so there was a lot of um, dissatisfaction. It wasn't just about uh, how people uh, complain and 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 uh, uh, write their comments on tweet or or or, or on on Facebook. It was also about the. the, the the kind of social unrest that we are starting to to see in different countries, and the closest, of course, was what was, what was going on with the one percent riots in, in the United States, and then, of course, uh, there's the whole Trump era that starts, and and uh, so so I was very very concerned by that. I, I wasn't necessarily I didn't want to model the show on one specific conflict or one specific uh, subject. I, I wanted it to be kind of more freeform so that it applied not just to international uh, political realities, but also to our local uh, political realities. And of course, after that, we a lot of stuff happened in Canada. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, uh, I tried to leave it, open, leave it open as much as I could because uh, I know that Stratford has a, um, an international universal audience also who, who you know people come from all over the place and they, they come from different political realities and so I didn't want it to make it a very specific thing. And so uh, in that regard it's a modern setting against Roman iconic ruins and monuments. <clears throat> yeah so it, it so it feels like it's it feels both like it's Italy and Europe and also that it's yeah. the United States and Capitol Hill and yeah. the senators and, and congressmen. It, it very much feels international. What was the inspiration of modern versus ancient? Well, I had the chance like a, a, a year before we started this whole creative process in Coriolanus to perform in Rome. And uh, it's quite interesting because you, you, you know, you, you're in a very modern contemporary hotel and you're watching television and you're watching uh, local uh, politicians speak and all that. And then you walk out and you have these ruins and these uh, temples and what used to be the Senate and what used to be the, a, pu a public place where uh, tribunes would speak and all that. And it's all, all kind of uh, clashes and mixes and all that. So, so I thought it was interesting to set it uh, in a kind of modern day imaginary Rome where um, the, the the future is filled with the past, right? So so you always have reminders of what this society used to be and, and, and how we never learn from history, which is, I mean, it's, it's certainly not in uh, these days, is that, you know, you, you look at what's going on in Europe and, 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 and certainly in those days, uh, two, two, three years ago with the rise of all the uh, uh, neo-fascism starting and all that, and you go, do people remember that just like, 50 years ago, uh, we were coming at for maybe 60 years now. We were coming out of a, a world conflict that was all that was all triggered and 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 uh, that started on these exact same things. So so people's memories are very short. So so it was important for me to create a kind of an, an environment where you, whatever conflict or tragedy is being played in front of you, even though it's contemporary, that in the background there's always a reminder or an echo from the past. I remember having a discussion with you about one particular scene where you have the Senate meeting in a bathhouse mm -hmm. and uh, having a discussion uh, in the uh, caldarium. And, okay. uh, and uh, you, uh, you had research done on, mm -hmm. on this. And do you tell us about the discovery? Yeah, it's just that, of course, this was completely intuitive and, and, and the intuition was, was confirmed as a good one later on, is that um, in the early days of democracy, I guess, people did not have all these very fancy uh, auditoriums where the Senate would meet and they would talk and all that, and they would look for uh, uh, places where, there'd be, where the sound would be good, where people would be heard if they're just standing in the middle of the room that would have a, cer a certain shape. Um, and uh, so they, they would hang out in bathhouses, and that's where a lot of these first speeches and these first meetings uh, happen in bathhouses and, and uh, so it was you know quite quite a coincidence but I guess more of an intuition than any, anything else uh, <clears throat> because we know that at the time uh, power was a, a 
something that belonged to men. And so it was a place for men only. Um, so so it, it felt a bit kind of a, um, it was a kind of a kooky idea when we start toying with it. But then of course, when we discovered this thing that actually these places were called bathhouses, uh, when they'd have a meeting um, in, in the bathhouse, that, that's what they would say. Of course, that changed and when they actually built actual buildings to have these conversations and these, these meetings. Uh, uh, they, they, kept, they kept the nickname of Bathhouse. Um, yeah, it's funny about the, all that changed with time as people, um, as the uh, ancient world went away and the feudal era began, uh, they probably wouldn't know what a bathhouse would be. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, um, Robert, uh, the use of technology in this production Mm -hmm. it, it, on, in, in, you said this play is not about any one thing, but among the things that it is about, it feels mm -hmm. to me like it's partially about how we communicate in mm -hmm. the modern era, the separation between source and, uh, yeah. and listener and the communication. There's texting, there's mm -hmm. radio, there are, you know, uh, uh, cameras that capture. What, was your, what were your thoughts in, in trying to lay all that out? Well, there's something very practical about new technologies is that if, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know better than I do, you, you, uh, you do big productions and, and we're always kind of uh, preoccupied by uh, cast size and, and, and uh, are there going to be a lot of soldiers in that battle? There are going to be a lot of uh, tribunes in that, in, in that uh, scene and all that. So we're always preoccupied by uh, um, shows that we can't really stage anymore because we don't have the means to have so many people on stage and all that. Uh, and uh, technology offers a kind of an option. If you're going to set something at the time of talk shows or, or talk radio, um, you don't need to have 200 people on a public square uh, screaming to the, the, the politician what they think. You, you, you have three guys sitting around a, uh, <coughs> a, a talk radio uh, table and, and, and they, they get, uh, you hear the voices of people calling in. And that's how the whole... Uh, piece uh, starts and, and uh, so so there's something very practical about using technology because we're in the age where we have these huge huge, huge forums but they're all of course uh, uh, they imply that this one person alone sitting in his uh, living room with a, uh, a, a video doing a video conference <laughs> you know so so that for me was there was something very practical about that that we could actually pretend that that uh, there was a lot of people on stage. In fact, there was very few people on stage uh, compared to other uh, curling uh, stagings or, or what usually uh, one of these Roman plays uh, asks of a, a theater company. Robert, um, he, as I said at the beginning of this, you're a playwright, you're a director, you're an actor. But one of the things you also are is you're a magician in the sense that you are able to create uh, magic on stage and we... Uh, metaphors, uh, visual effects that that surprise us and help us see things in new ways. Um, and I mentioned magician because they don't like to tell people their tricks. Yeah. So, um, what are you comfortable? <laughs> people who watch this film are going to see a stage production that was mesmerizing. It had both a reality and a way of dissolving that reality, which was filmic to say the least. How did you arrive at the shape? of the mm -hmm. stage, the ideas behind it, in the roughest terms, so that people aren't, mm -hmm. uh, aren't uh, looking for the, the yeah, how yeah. it was done. Yeah, well, the this, this thing is that in the um, uh, audiences today have a very, very strong and cultivated uh, film vocabulary. People are used to having stories told to them through television and through film, uh, and uh, they, they, they know without knowing that the actual terms, they, they, they know what a, a flash forward is, a cut to, a, you know, there's all these techniques that help you understand how, uh, how, how the story goes. And um, so I wanted to use that vocabulary, but in the theater, and what the advantage of that <clears throat> was that um, by framing what was going on, uh, very often you could actually, like in cinema, uh, as somebody is saying something, you could actually frame on something else or on somebody else's reaction. So you kind of underline uh, certain ideas that you can't really do on a <clears throat> broad stage. I mean, you could do a lot of stuff on a broad stage, but it's just that you, you don't control the focus of the audience as much <clears throat> or as well as a, uh, a, a, film, <clears throat> a film shot. 
So uh, it, there was a kind of a control uh, thing that was going on <coughs> with this because uh, Coriolanus is a wonderful play, but it is, of course it's all over the place and it takes a lot of editing and a lot of uh, uh, cleaning up for, for, for the, 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 the main plot to, to, to come out. And uh, so it was important for me to have a bit more control on what the people see uh, and what you choose them to see. And, and of course you have to fight uh, with uh, a, a public that resists that because they come to the theater to be free, to be free to turn their heads and to actually uh, zero in on something that's not exact. So you have to constantly try to, uh, in a very non-violent way, frame what you want them to see and actually be playful with the audience. The audience liked, it, we, it, we turned it into a kind of a game, you know, people liked having a, a segues and, 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 and almost camera pans happen, even though they weren't done with a real camera. They were done with just kind of two panels that would be moving on one side or so. Uh, so you had to, uh, by using that vocabulary, that framing vocabulary, you had to transform it into some kind of a game, some kind of a, a, a fun thing. So people would always go, ah, okay, oh, I understand. Oh, right, oh, this is how it's done. This is... So so the audience feels intelligent as we're trying to fool it. <laughs> they feel intelligent. They feel, oh, they, oh, this is the rule of the game. Oh, I get it. Oh, this is refers to this kind of shot. This kind of... So, so there's a lot of double play and double entente in the staging that people enjoy and, and we all enjoy feeling intelligent, don't we? <laughs> so. um, Robert, uh, you directed Coriolanus when you were um, the director of the National Arts Center French mm -hmm. Theatre. I don't know if it was yeah. exactly there, but this is a play you've returned yeah. to. How did mm -hmm. it change in the 30 years or 25 years that had passed and what drew you back to Coriolanus? Yeah, well, actually, uh, what drew me back to, to, to doing Coriolanus because the first version that I had staged um, didn't satisfy me enough. And of course, I did not have the means in those days to do the full blown idea that I had, which was this idea of uh, this whole camera uh, kind of framing thing. Uh, we had one big giant frame, and everything was played with that. And it was set nowadays, of course. So a lot of the ideas. Uh, were already there. The only thing is that people were less preoccupied by, the, the, let's say, the, the, uh, the, the themes and the ideas that, that were in, in the play. Uh, they are more preoccupied today, maybe because things have evolved so much and we've been through so much turmoil. And, and, and I'd have to say that this was like in 1989 or something like that, 1990. And um, uh, People's uh, people didn't really have a good understanding of what was the what was a state what was at stake um, in Coriolanus. So uh, the, the the play was interesting. We, we I think we did a good job, but um, there were I'd say there were very very shy ideas there that with time kind of uh, uh, grew in the back of my brain or something. And then when I got the chance to do it again, to really do it full blown with all the means. Uh, that I needed to to uh, express what it is I wanted to express. So I have to ask you, having done it now, and we've got a film that people are going to watch, uh, were you more satisfied? Of course. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing. There's, there's one thing, I mean, uh, there's the directorial work, of course, and there's the design, there's all of that, and I think that we did a good job. But it's the meeting with these amazing actors, uh, and when you get the chance to work with, with these fantastic Stratford actors who know much more about sometimes the text than you do, and, and, and it's an exchange. I mean, that's the things that you, 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 you have your idea, this is what you want to do, this is how you see the character, this is how you see the scene. But actors, certainly uh, Stratford, uh, actors who have all this experience in, in sh doing Shakespeare and all that have a lot to say and you have to be open to that and you have to let that in and, and I think it's that amazing uh, collaboration that gave way to all sorts of extraordinary discoveries that we did along the way. Um, so that's why we did these workshops very early on. Uh, I, I had, I had this, these very vague things that I'd say to them and some situations and say and they would just kind of be um, uh, actually uh, allowed to, to suggest stuff and do stuff and all that. And, 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 and the, the, uh, the rehearsal room was filled with ideas and propositions that weren't all my ideas. They were mainly the actor's ideas. So, so that was amazing for me. It was a great learning process. We had a lot of stuff to teach to each other. And uh, uh, 
so, so, so even though my concept, I think, was a solid concept when we started, um, you know, it, it would have been very, very stale and very arid if, if they hadn't uh, taken it and, and chewed, <laughs> chewed it and break it. And, you know, so, so it was a very, very playful process. And, and uh, you know, I'd say, you know, 75% of, of all the great ideas there didn't come from me. That's for sure. Well, I know that that company loved working with you and uh, we have to get you back to Stratford soon. We are cooking yeah. something up. We're not going to give any uh, <laughs> anything away, but yeah. uh, Robert, uh, as they say, à la prochaine. Avec grand plaisir. Thank you. <laughs>